All good on the mic? Yeah, it's on. That one is off. Okay. You click it on. There's a flip. Yeah. Okay, let me flip it and make sure that this is But this one is off. This one's on. Joey is 
what is this? Do you know? Uh, that is a light. It's a light. Ah, okay. That may or may not get turned up. That may or may not. Oh, I love the way you have it. That's Terry's. This is be great. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Ted Janoulis. I'm a past president of the Explorers Club. And on behalf of all of us at the club here, welcome tonight. Um, Angela Schuster, who is our extraordinary editor of the Explorers Journal, is your host for the evening. But since we had a, um, a fair number of people who are here for the first time, she asked if I could set the scene just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I would say, first of all, that I think we have some new people at the club because we have an absolutely rock star lineup of explorers tonight. So this is a thrilling night, and especially to have it be about the future of exploration is extra special. So when you walked past the 12-foot skeleton and came into our <laughs> Harry Potterish like building, you may have seen a plaque of the, the famous first, which date back to the origin of the club in 1904. Back then, so much of exploration was around the white spaces, the North Pole, the South Pole. In fact, that's one of Perry's sledges from the first trip to the, to the North Pole. Um, but from there, it expanded. And those are two of the famous firsts. But then it was the top of Everest, and Sir Edmund Hillary was our honorary chair. And then it was to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. And, Don Walsh and uh, Jim Cameron and uh, Victor Escobar, all members of the club. Um, and then moving to the bottom, the fifth famous first is the, the trip to the moon. And all of the landings of the Apollo program carried Explorers Club flags. There's a tiny little space at the bottom there. We're, we're holding it for Mars. And since uh, Jeff Bezos is our honorary chair and Elon Musk and Richard Branson are all members, we think we have a kind of a, a hold on that. Um, but having said that, um, today, Things have expanded quite a bit. We're 3,800 members all around the globe, 35 plus chapters, and our members explore everything from the deep sea to outer space to mountains, deserts, jungles, valleys, you name it, they explore it. And the one thing that binds everybody together uh, is that sense of curiosity and wonder, and also that idea that when you come back, you owe it to everybody to share that and hopefully make the world a better place with it. So today, our, our members are increasingly interested not only in going someplace first, but also going with a new set of eyes or a new set of sensibilities, new technologies, new sense of, of wonder. Um, but we also have an increased interest in sustainability, conservation, and more and more of our programming is around that. Uh, we give out grants uh, for, on behalf of a variety of uh, different folks from Rolex to Discovery and many others. We have 
a lot of lectures like this. We have Oceans Week, we have Climate Week, we have the Global Exploration Summit. So we really try to get the world um, thinking about exploration and how to do more of it, and at the same time, thinking about the next generation and how we can help them along, which I know that's something that Terry had spent a lot of his time on, which would be great to hear about tonight. Um, but also thinking about how we can be more inclusive in terms of building an explore base uh, for the future. So that's a little bit about the club. You would have ordinarily been able to see into our members lounge where Tar Hardell's globe is. Um, Discovery is currently redoing our bar. So when you're here next time, you have to come and have one of our signature cocktails such as the Shackleton Not Stirred or the Cosmonaut, <laughs> Cosmonautopolitan or of course my favorite, the Hardell Highball. So if you came up the stairs then, you notice you're in this incredible building, which was built by one of the grandsons of the co-founder of Singer Sewing Machines. And if you haven't taken a tour, you absolutely have to do it. It's exquisite, it's an amazing place. Um, and then if you come in here, uh, you're in the ballroom. And it's hard to describe how many amazing people have come here and talked about exploring the world and, and what it's like. It's just really something, and tonight that tradition is going to continue, which we're, we're so pleased about. Um, and we're surrounded here by not only Perry Sledge, but also flags. Um, we have over 200 flags that uh, if you want to go on expedition, you can go before the Flag and Honors Committee and check out a flag, and then the flags develop their own history and genealogy, and then when they do something really cool, we retire them so they don't get lost, stolen, or broken. So this is the Kantiki flag over here. Um, Angela, I don't know what happened to Roy Chapman Andrews. Usually there's a flag right there. And we also have our, our prototype flags, which are kind of like a baseball Yeah, yeah. So flag number two is usually there. Roy Chapman Andrews, a famous expedition, model for, one of the models for Indiana Jones. We actually have his original whip upstairs. So when you come back, you can see that. You can see a piece of Contiki. You can also um, see the, um, the President <laughs> Roosevelt's application for membership in which he lists being President of the United States fourth, which I don't know why he did that, but. <laughs> but my favorite thing in the club, and I'm wrapping up here, I promise, I'll get over to our, our incredible program tonight. My favorite thing is all the lunar landings uh, generally carried flags were about this big, and you can see one down in the lobby. The one that decided to carry a bigger flag was Apollo 13 of all of them. So if you very gently uh, look behind the screen on your way out, you can see the Apollo 13 flag in its original baggie, and next to it is a note of apology from Commander James Lovell saying, sorry we didn't get a chance to unwrap the flag, we're kind of busy skidding out into oblivion, all that kind of thing. And there's a line there in the letter you can see, one of my favorite phrases ever in exploration, his description of Apollo 13 were, plans were disrupted. <laughs> So with that in mind, you're in a magical place, you're with magical presenters, you're going to magical stories. We're so thrilled to, that we're going to be a part of this tonight. We welcome you all heartily and hope you'll come back lots. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Angela Schuster. Thank you, everybody. Well, I would like to say, um, being editor of the Explorer's Journal is probably one of the craziest um, jobs I've ever had. I've been in the word monkey business for many, many years, having been an editor for Archaeology Magazine, and anyway, I've fixed texts all over the planet, but I am never, I never cease to be amazed at where the curiosity of our members takes us. You know, it's like, who to thunk? Anyway, um, I'm Angela Schuster, um, editor of the journal, and I just want to give a quick shout out to our creative director, Jesse Alexander, who... Um, <laughs> basically makes your stories pop off the page. I fix the text and he just does the visuals and it's just been a joy um, to have been working with him since I think 2007 and we're constantly noodling. Every time I think our executive director, Will Roseman, asked me at some point, don't you ever get bored? And it's like, who has the time, you know? <laughs> so anyway, tonight with that introduction, I have the pleasure of introducing two um, visionary forces in the realm of exploration. Um, Photographer Chris Rainier and explorer extraordinaire, I don't know what to, how else to put it, Terry Garcia, um, who have teamed up. And these are indeed forces. Um, Chris was the recipient of our 2004 Lowell Thomas Award. And as I learned tonight, he has just been elected a fellow of this August institution. He's a photographer, documentary filmmaker, and he's the, um, a National Geographic explorer and the director of the Cultural Sanctuaries Foundation, um, which is doing just tremendous work in terms of preserving 
um, traditional lifeways and things like that. Um, Terry has been hanging out with us since 2013. And for those of you who know, the Explorers Club and National Geographic have always had this somewhat <laughs> odd, we love each other, we hate each other, we dance around, but obviously with Roy Chapman Andrews, and I mean, it's just been kind of a little more incestuous than it probably is appropriate. But anybody who ever had an expedition with National Geographic, if you got it funded, you probably dealt with Terry Garcia. He was like the exchequer, the, the gatekeeper, the whatever you want to call it, just, you know, he's the person that really made sure the projects were sound and that the funding was sound. And there are so many people whose careers have just been launched because Terry had the foresight to, uh, to um, say that this is something that needed funded. So they have just collaborated. So you take, you know, it's like Godzilla and Mothra and make them work together on a book. <laughs> and so they have a marvelous new volume out called The Future of Exploration, Discovering Uncharted Frontiers of Science, Technology, and Human Potential, which features essays by some of the most eminent explorers around the world. And they did an article for us for the Explorer's Journal, the fall edition, which they're free copies if you were um, lucky enough to snag one. And when they came to talk to us, we said, so af after talking to all these fabulous people, what did you come away with? Tell us what you came away with. And that's what they're going to share with us tonight. So I believe, Terry, you're going to be starting us off? Anyway, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, full disclosure, uh, Chris and I just got back from Mongolia where we managed to pick up some sort of Mongolian flu. <clears throat> it's, it's all done now. No, nope, no. Nope. It's been three weeks, uh, but we're still a little hoarse, and uh, so I'll, I'll apologize for that. So uh, you don't need mask. Yeah, yeah. That's a way to clear out the room, right, Sven? <laughs> Okay, all right, thanks for being here. Um, so what, I, I found that when you publish a book, you get a lot of questions. And one of the most frequent questions that I've been getting is why? Uh, why did you do this? What was the motivation? And obviously it was a collaboration, so there were a number of reasons why we wanted to do this. For me, it was informed by 17 years of, of running the National Geographic Exploration Enterprise, as well as leading a government agency that was responsible for the protection of the oceans and the atmosphere. And they were incredible jobs. I, I literally had the best jobs on the planet. And one of the things that I wanted to do was to share the excitement of exploration with readers. Uh, and there is nothing more exciting than the moment of discovery, when all of the work, all of the frustration, all of the angst, the waiting is finally over. As in here, uh, where we were waiting in a subterranean vault in Kabul, uh, waiting, uh, hoping that improbably the uh, Bactrian gold treasure had somehow survived four decades of civil war and strife. Uh, or in this case, on a very cold November evening in the Palazzo Vecchia in Florence, inserting a camera behind the wall to see if a, a masterpiece by Da Vinci that hadn't been seen in over 500 years was still there. And so, one of the things I wanted to do was to also um, you know, share with people who these people are. What is it that, that drives these explorers? And so at National Geographic, we had this thing called the Explorer Symposium. Uh, and every year we would bring together um, promising young explorers uh, along with our established grantees. And it would go on for a week, and people would exchange information. There'd be presentations, a lot of camaraderie, a lot of adult beverages. And <clears throat> at the end of the week, there would be a closing ceremony. And oftentimes, we would invite a celebrity to help us close. And so this year, in 2012, we invited the comedian Reggie Watts. And he had been there all week, and he was 
uh, mingling with the explorers. He had a bunch of uh, stories that he'd collected, and he was doing his thing. He was talking about National Geographic, and he started to riff on the National Geographic mission. And he was recalling the sort of stilted 19th century language of the mission, which was the increase and diffusion of geographic knowledge. And he said, you know, actually, that was not the original mission of National Geographic. The original mission statement was when Gil Grosvenor was in the field, and he said to his colleague, hey, what's that over there? <laughs> and he actually had a point. Uh, because there is, I think, in some of us, uh, maybe most people, th this, this sort of uh, instinct to want to know what's around the corner, uh, what's just beyond the next hill, what's you know, over the horizon. And the book explores that. Uh, but it also asks the question of whether or not it's really just about what's around the corner or is exploration just curiosity acted upon? Oh, thank you. We're going to need this. <clears throat> and I don't think it was curiosity for this woman, uh, Wasfia Nazreen, who has summited the seven summits, but also has risked everything to advance uh, equality for women in Bangladesh, uh, as well as recognition of the true heroes of Everest, the Sherpas. And curiosity can't explain why somebody would walk 1,500 miles for almost two years through one of the most impenetrable forests on the planet, or why somebody would go on a crash diet so they could lose enough weight that they could slip through a very tiny opening in a subterranean cave, knowing that maybe they wouldn't get out. And it doesn't explain why uh, someone would endure having their eyeballs freeze climbing Everest, which is what happened to Jim Whitaker, the mountain climber, uh, who said, that wasn't the worst part. The worst part was when they thawed, that the pain was indescribable. Now, the evolutionary anthropologist, a guy named Svante Pava, who, who recently received a Nobel Prize, said that there's no mammal that moves around as much as we do and that it's a kind of madness. But it's maybe not madness. Maybe it's genetic. There's some scientists who think that there's a tiny percentage of the population that has a gene, they call it a restless gene, uh, that makes them prone to risk-taking, that makes them receptive to movement, to change, to new ideas. And whatever it is, there are some people where this, they have this drive to explore, uh, this tendency to push to the limits of human endurance, and it's a very strong drive. And it's like this fellow, uh, Eric uh, Weinmayer, uh, who is a world-class climber. He's also blind. And his essay, like a number of essays, demonstrate this point about this, this, this drive that these few individuals have. And Eric describes crossing the uh, icefall on Everest. I'm just going to read a, a brief passage of what he says. He says, sometimes the crevasses were so wide, I couldn't feel the other side with my trekking poles. The only way across was a literal leap of faith. The members of my climbing team would tap their poles on the opposite bank where they wanted me to land, and then I'd jump. Yeah, OK, so they're not wired like most people. <laughs> so the other reason for writing the book, and th this is the sort of central thesis of, of what it's all about, and that is my belief, our belief, that this is a new age of exploration, that the 21st century is going to be the greatest age of exploration in the history of humankind, that there's still mysteries out there, there's still surprises, there, there in fact are still a few blank spaces on the map, and in large part this, this new age is being driven by new technology, uh, technology that, that basically is giving us a key to unlock mysteries, to unlock doors that we thought were closed permanently to us, uh, and in fact, revealing doors we didn't know existed.
And we've got a number of examples in the book about how technology is opening some of these doors. Now, one example is an essay by Chris Fisher, who is an archaeologist. And he tells the, <coughs> excuse me, the, the story of the search for the city of the monkey god and how LIDAR was used to reveal something that hadn't been seen in perhaps a thousand years. And for those who um, don't know the story, uh, there was a, there's been this, this rumor for centuries actually that there was a city in the very sort of dense tropical jungle of Honduras uh, that was made entirely of white stone and that the residents there worshiped a monkey god. And it was first picked up by this guy, Cortez, and he wrote a letter to the king of Spain and said, I've got it on good authority uh, that there is this province in Honduras that has riches that exceed those in Mexico, uh, that it has cities that are larger than those in Mexico. And there were other reports that there was this place in Honduras where people ate off of gold plates, and the Spaniards loved that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> And there were other rumors that there was this place in the jungle where the native people had fled uh, to escape the uh, Spanish. Well, Cortez searched for it. He never found it. A lot of people looked for it over the centuries. They never found it. And then this, this guy came along, Theodore Mord. And he was an American adventurer and explorer. And he was sent by the Museum of the American Indian uh, to lead an expedition to Honduras in the 1940s. Uh, Mord went in, four months later he came out, uh, and he claimed that he had found the city of the monkey god, that he had found this, this high-walled city that had this, this massive pyramid with a staircase that led up to a dais, and the monkey god himself was, was sitting on the dais, and he brought back all of these artifacts to prove his, his claim. Uh, but he wouldn't tell anybody where it was. Uh, and he never returned to Honduras. And then he committed suicide. And so the secret was lost with him. And people assumed that the trail had grown cold. Until Steve Elkins, who is a member of the club, uh, came along. Uh, commissioned a LIDAR survey, and LIDAR is a technology, it's based on a laser technology, and the, the beauty of it for archaeologists is it will strip away the uh, foliage, the tree canopy, and allow you to see where the terrain has been uh, worked by uh, human activity. And they found one site where it appeared that the, uh, the, the earth had been worked uh, substantially uh, by humans. And so they had to go in and ground truth it. Uh, so Steve, Chris Fisher, uh, National Geographic photographer, and a, a team of specialists uh, went in. Uh, they found a two and a half square kilometer sized city. Uh, it had plazas, uh, uh, buildings, pyramid shaped uh, uh, structures. And there, there was a clearing there where there were about uh, 50 to 60 of, of these intricately carved stone statues of, of spirit animals, uh, like a weird jaguar, uh, serpents, uh, snakes. This is what that looks like when it's uh, cleaned up. And so <clears throat> when they came back and told me what they had found, naturally I had to go see it. And so Chris and I, uh, along with a couple of colleagues from National Geographic, set out for Honduras. Chris had warned us that this is an exceedingly unpleasant place. Um, and he put special emphasis on the venomous snakes. Uh, the place is full of coral snakes, jumping vipers, uh, a fertile ants, which is called the ultimate viper, uh, very aggressive and deadly. Uh, all sorts of, of unpleasant uh, 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 tropical diseases, malaria, dengue fever, uh, stinging plants, uh, just truly a very hostile place. And so I made sure that we had anti you know, snake venom, anti venom uh, for the fertile ants, because if you're bitten by that, you're dead, uh, as well as snake gators, all sorts of equipment. Uh, and uh, we went in. Uh, 
Fortunately, everything went fine. We had the Honduran military give us a ride on a helicopter, which was probably, in retrospect, not the smartest thing that we did and maybe the riskiest thing we did. Um, we got out, no problems with the snakes, uh, got back to Washington, and it turned out that my uh, concern about snakes was probably misplaced, that what we should have been concerned about, what I should have been concerned about, uh, were the sand flies that were everywhere and that were stinging us. And these sand flies carry a parasite that causes a disease called leishmaniasis, uh, which is a very unpleasant disease. And the only way to treat this particular variant is through a very heavy duty course of chemotherapy. Uh, half the team, it turned out, contracted the disease. We had to send them to NIH uh, where they were treated. The, the treatment is as bad or almost as bad as the disease itself. But after the treatment, team returned. Uh, I wanted to go back. Uh, there were some family members who thought that was not a good idea. One of them's in the audience here. Um, <laughs> and uh, did, did not. So um, another example of how technology is producing uh, phenomenal results uh, is this gentleman. This is uh, Lee Berger. And one October uh, evening, I received a uh, call from Lee. And he was very excited. And if, if you know Lee, he's a, a really enthusiastic guy. But this was Lee times 10. He was literally vibrating on the other end of the phone. And he said, Terry, if, if you have ever believed in me, you have to believe in me now. And he made his pitch for why I needed to give him a grant, which, which I did. But the, the back story is that a couple of years prior to that call, Lee had made this stunning discovery of a nearly intact uh, new hominin species called Australopithecus sediba. And while they were excavating it, they had to pause to put this canopy over it to protect it. And so Lee had nothing to do. And he started going back looking at his old research. And he had done a, a survey of this area just outside of Johannesburg, you know, the most populous city on, on the, one of the most populous cities on the planet. It's called the Cradle of Humankind. And he had identified uh, these limestone outcroppings. Uh, there were approximately 10 of them. And they indicated cave systems. And he felt that these cave systems would contain or likely would contain fossils. And so uh, he um, uh, called two of his uh, good friends, his buddies, uh, Steve and Rick, uh, these cavers, and he sent them out to investigate the caves. And they did the first nine, came up with nothing. Uh, the last one was the rising star cave system. And that was last because uh, they considered it the least likely to contain any fossils because it had been used by cavers over the, the years for, for a decade at least. And if something was there, presumably somebody would have found something. But they went in anyway, and it took them a while. They had to spend about an hour going, you know, slithering to, through some very narrow passageways. And now, I want you to imagine that you're there with Rick and Steve. It's pitch black. You can't see your hand in front of your face. Uh, they're at the end of what they think is the pathway. And one of them notices that, hey, there's a hole in the floor. Uh, it looks like a chute that leads down into another chamber. Um, it's 19 centimeters. That's about seven and a half inches. Uh, and Rick or Steve says, well, it's completely dark down there. Maybe it's a chamber. I don't really know how deep it is. Maybe it's 10 feet, could be 50, maybe 100 feet. Uh, not sure if uh, I'll be able to get back up if we do go down there. And the other one goes, yeah, that's a good plan. Let's uh, do that. <laughs> um, so um, uh, S Steve, who uh, the Lee describes as a human toothpick, uh, is able to get down this, this seven and a half inch opening uh, and lands in a chamber. It's about the size of a walk-in closet and on the floor everywhere are bones. 
uh, over the next several months, year, Lee and his team discover the largest assemblage of hominid fossils ever found. It's a new species, uh, Homo naledi. Uh, not only that, Lee suggests that Homo naledi, which is a, you know, it's a distant relative, but it's not human, was using this as a, a place to dispose of its dead, something only humans do, by the way. Lee decides that he wants to take a look one day. He goes on this crash diet, loses a bunch of weight, <clears throat> somehow is able to shoehorn himself uh, into this, this little 19 centimeter hole, almost gets stuck and doesn't get out. But while he's down there, uh, he discovers this, that apparently they were making artwork on the wall and had used fire. So, we also explore uh, how and why we explore. This is the philosopher Immanuel Kant, and uh, he's known for the ethical principle uh, ought implies can. And we ask an ethicist, Simon Longstaff, to write an essay about what are the ethics of exploration. And it's the last essay in the book. And Simon has inverted Kant's maxim uh, to ask the question, does can imply ought? Just because we have the technology, just because we can do something, should we? And he poses as one of the examples uh, work of a, a number of scientists who are examining whether or not we can bring back extinct species if we have access to their genetic material. And there's a pro prominent scientist at Harvard who's uh, formed his own company. And one of the objectives is to bring back this, the uh, Tasmanian tiger, uh, and possibly a woolly mammoth. And Simon poses the question, but basically why? Um, if we can do this, uh, how would they adapt to a changed environment? Uh, if we could do this, how many would we bring back? Would it be one, two, six? Uh, and basically ask the question before you do it. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to do this, that I was involved in the investigation of the explosion on the Deepwater Horizon oil rig. And there were a lot of reasons why it exploded and was, it was this massive disaster. But one of the things we discovered, uh, and it's this phenomenon associated with new technology, was that we could build it, but we couldn't fix it. That we had the ability to do something extraordinary with a, from an engineering standpoint. We could, uh, with precision, hit this point a mile down in the ocean. Uh, it's kind of like landing a man on the moon. We could build it, but if something went wrong, we did not have the capability of addressing the problem in a timely and effective manner. And it's a characteristic of lots of new technologies. And so Simon was not saying, don't do it, uh, but rather, what are the questions that you need to ask? Ethical exploration. So we also have a number of, of uh, new early career explorers who have joined us in contributing essays. And they, they pose a number of questions, but they also suggest that exploration should be more than just finding new things, but that this new age of exploration needs to be about finding solutions to global problems. They also argue that we need new perspectives, uh, that looking at the world through a single lens or through a lens that's been used time and time again is a very narrow approach and provides a distorted view. Uh, they also talk about the barriers that uh, we confront that need to be removed in order for us to be able to effectively address some of the challenges. So this is Katie Croft Bell. She's an ocean explorer. And she uh, raises the question of, in addition to uh, what will be discovered, we also must have in mind who is doing the exploring. And that right now, 
the richest countries and the richest institutions have a monopoly on ocean exploration, uh, which is stymieing the, the ability to produce the kinds of results and knowledge that we need. Uh, and she's involved in creating uh, low-cost distributed technology that will be available to a large community of explorers around the world that will accelerate uh, the pace at which we're understanding the ocean. Uh, this is Paula Cahumba. She's an ecologist. She begins her essay by saying that exploration ha has always looked different from an African perspective, that what was, was new and exotic to European explorers was already known by the Africans, and it was well understood, and that you know, our worldview is obviously going to have to be informed by science, by Western science, but it, critically, it must be also informed by traditional knowledge. And this is uh, Dr. Sammy Ramsey, who is a, he's basically, he's a world expert in honeybees. Phenomenal speaker, you need to have him here at the, the club. But he talks about more subtle barriers, um, the, the barriers that are based on perceptions. And he said, I was asked to leave my PhD program, not on the basis of any failure to meet a standard, but because I was told that there was something about me that didn't seem like doctoral material. <laughs> so the, the other reason I wanted to do this is that I believe that exploration can change the world. Uh, you know, Sylvia Earle likes to talk about how to change, first you need to know, and that with knowledge comes caring, and with caring comes action. And many of these essays examine the notion of exploration with purpose. And for me, the, the proof point was when this conservation uh, biologist came, and he said he wanted to do a transect uh, it was going to be the entire length of Gabon. He was going to walk 1,500 miles. Uh, it would take nearly two years. And we said, that, that's crazy. Uh, but it's also a crazy good story. And so we, we put him out there. And Mike, he walked and he walked and he walked. Uh, he saw animals that were completely naive to humans. And when he got to the, the coast, he saw elephants and hippos that were surfing in the ocean. And what Mike had hoped to do was that maybe save a tiny sliver of this last pristine forest on the African continent. And so he went out there uh, on the speaking circuit. We did stories about him. And he was into it about a year. And we got a, a call, a communication from the government of Gabon. And they said that they wanted to meet with Mike. And so we sent Mike off to Gabon. Uh, he met with the president and with the cabinet, and he laid out everything that he had seen. And at the end of the meeting, uh, they decided that they were going to set aside 10% of the entire land ar area of the country and create 11 national parks. And it was solely because of, of one very focused, some would say obsessed, individual and the very compelling narrative that came out of his scientific research. Uh, this is Millennium Atoll, and, and some of you know Enrique Sala. And Enrique was, was uh, inspired by Mike, by the megatransect. He came to me and he said, I want to do a megatransect of the ocean. Uh, I want to go to the last wild places on the planet, the last pristine places, survey them, uh, document them, and then take that information and, and push it out to a global public and, more importantly, to the decision makers and pressure them to protect these areas. And he created something called the Pristine Seas Initiative. Uh, and it's been going on for several years, still is. And over the course of those years, it has protected millions of square miles of ocean, again, as a result of scientific research, but also a compelling narrative associated with it. So exploration can change the world. It can inspire people. It can inspire them to take action. And I'll just leave you with this. Uh, I'm hoping, we're hoping, that we're going to sell a lot of books. Bec you know, now, because Chris and I are not going to receive any income from these books, uh, not a dime. The publisher has agreed that they're going to do it uh, at cost. And whatever profits there are, 
we're going to provide in the way of grants to, to early career explorer scientists. Um, because I'd, I'd remind you as you're sitting here that at this very moment, uh, there are men and women that are in some of the, the most dangerous places, enduring really unimaginable hardships uh, to search for the truth and for what's truly important to save it. And that more importantly, there are many more. There, there, there are people who are ready, they're willing, they're able to go, if only they had the means. And so I hope you'll join us on that, and thank you very much. And now, my partner, Chris Green. Thank you, Terry. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here and to be here again. I've lectured here a number of times, and it's a honor to sit in this hollowed space. So I am going to queue up. Great. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey tonight. For me, exploration is in my DNA. A distant relative named Peter William Rainier was a British naval admiral who, along with Admiral Vancouver, mapped much of the northwest coast of the United States in the late 1700s. Mount Rainier was named after him. My grandfather was born in the back of an ox cart in the Transvaal of South Africa. He fought in the last of the Boer Wars and at 17 years old slung an elephant rifle across his shoulder and walked the length of Africa for five years and eventually wrote the first of his seven adventure books. My father's life was no less extraordinary. He was raised in the jungles of Colombia, where his father was by then running an emerald mine, the Chavor emerald mine, fighting off bandits to survive. My, my dad essentially raised himself. He spoke the local indigenous language before he taught himself English. When the Second World War broke out and he was shipped back to Africa, and, pretending to be older than he was, signed up to be a Spitfire pilot for the Royal Rhodesian Air Force, soon to be flying over North Africa, fighting Rommel's Desert Army at the age of 15. <laughs> My brother and I had a remarkable childhood of adventure and exploration, often traveling with my father deep into the song lines of Aboriginal Australia, or living with the Maasai on the plains of Serengeti in East Africa. I suppose, for me, a life of exploration was inevitable. I know no other path. So here we are. When I was born in 1958, there were three billion people on the planet. Today, there are eight billion people. 200 species a day die. Every two weeks, an elder passes away, taking with them a traditional language forever. Every day, four billion images are loaded up on the internet. Indeed, the earth is under duress. Yet, there are places that ancient cultures still dance the sacred dance, places where the land as it was the day after creation places yet undiscovered and unexplored. This evening, I would like to share a few of the stories I have learned from my journeys from where the well-trodden path ends and the wonders of the unknown begin. My personal exploration is to understand indigenous cultures, cultures on the edge, cultures that have so much to teach us. And along the way, I've learned to share stories of both exploration and the remarkable world that is revealed when we all travel, when we explore, and when we go beyond the distant horizon as we have since the dawn of mankind. I'd like to take you first on a journey to a place that I discovered in the early 1990s. I found myself deep in the jungles of New Guinea. This is an island north of Australia. When I lived in Australia, I heard about this Stone Age culture. I first went there, fell in love with this rugged, raw land, 
and decided to go back. I ended up spending 10 years living in New Guinea for most of every year, often taking a dugout canoe and traveling months upstream, or simply renting a Cessna one way to go in, deep into the jungles. Over a 10-year period, I decided to um, break up the country uh, and the archipelago of New Guinea. Eastern side is Papua New Guinea that got it, its independence in 1975. On the western side is Irian Jaya or West Papua provi uh, province of Indonesia. What I discovered was a culture still pulsing in the ancient ways of rituals of death and birth and compensation. So, as I mentioned, I divided it up into 19 different sections and went to each of those sections to document and photograph the masks. One day I met this woman. She's up in Mount Hagen, which is about 500 miles from the, the coast. And what was so interesting about meeting her as she was preparing for the wedding that she was uh, involved in that day was the shell on her chest. The anthropologist I was traveling with found out by the number of dots on the uh, shell that that had been traded up from the coast 500 miles from valley to valley over a 300 year period of time. New Guinea is remarkable because it has over 1,200 languages, not just dialects, languages. So you can literally go from one valley to the next. One day I was walking along a trail, saw this old man with this beautiful bird of paradise uh, regalia in his hat. And through my guide, and I often had uh, one, maybe two, even three translators, um, he was looking up at this remarkable tree full of birds of paradise. I said, how many birds up in that tree? A very Western question. And the guide and the old man talked back and forth. And uh, in a very embarrassed tone, the guide said to me, we don't have words for numbers. My immediate reaction was, wow, what a primitive culture. But then I stopped for a moment to realize I had to learn to ask the right questions. What do these cultures know that we don't know? What do these cultures still align themselves with, understand and feel in the pulse of the jungle that we in the Western world have lost quantifying everything? I knew, again, that I needed to go deeper into the forest. It is a remarkable place full of mask and mask rituals. This is the famous Mun Men of New Guinea with their, their mud hats and their bamboo fingers. About halfway through my trip, I had heard about this young man that was going to be initiated. And the day before this image was taken, I had hiked over that hill, come down, and just to camera right was an old man sitting there watching me huff and puff up the trail. When I got to the top, through my translator, the old man said, which valley are you from? And quite conceivably, a white person could live in the next valley. He had literally never gone out of his valley. And I smiled and I said, many, many valleys away. And he kept persisting, no, which valley are you from? And then he smiled, he looked up at the sky, and he says, I know. You came from where the green meets the blue. He had heard of this place where the jungle ended, and it was the ocean. And I smiled and I wrote that down in my journal because in a way we're all from where the green meets the blue, this small, fragile island spinning in space. About 10 years ago, I had the privilege to lecture at a TED conference. I lectured and then the last woman to be up in the space station lectured. And then afterwards, she ran up to me in the green room. She says, you know, you're right. I used to sit up there in the, the space station and I'd look at this small green blue planet. I'd look out into infinity, and then I'd look back. Where the, me the green meets the blue is this small island that we live on, and we have no other option. We need to do more to protect it. One of the great things that happen in New Guinea are the rituals of life and death and war. And I had heard about this battle that was uh, going to happen. So at that time, I was working for Time magazine. I was a war photographer. I was spending a lot of time in Bosnia and Rwanda. And just before I went into 
this battle that I had heard about that was going to part, uh, take place, I got a telex from Time magazine, can you replace a photographer in Sarajevo in five weeks? And I said, yes, of course. Went in, spent about a week photographing this. Two, two villages had disagreed, and they had agreed to meet in this open field, and until a person was killed, they would continue to fight each other. Eventually, someone was killed with their Stone Age um, spears and bows and arrow, and they fought. And then, after that was over, they went up, shook hands, and everything was fine, and life went on. I hiked out, jumped on a plane, went to Sarajevo, and within days of being there, some of the fiercest fighting was going on, and it struck me, what, a, what an amazing conceit that we have as humans that we've evolved since the Stone Age. The only thing that we've evolved is the sophistication of the way we kill each other. Look what's going on in Gaza and the Ukraine right now. So that was a remarkable experience to document. Uh, many of you in the audience may recall Michael Rockefeller disappearing in New Guinea. I was so curious about that story, so I wanted to go down to the Asman and photograph the warriors down there in their fantastic war canoes, but also some of these uh, what are called peace poles. And actually, they have one, I think, upstairs. And also, if you've ever been to the Metropolitan, the um, Rockefeller Wing has examples of these. So I photograph those. Um, as much as they celebrate life, they also celebrate death and the rituals of death. They believe in reincarnation. In this particular village, the women cover themselves in muds and have these jobs tears that they take off for each day of the morning. When a respected elder passes away, they take the skull, they ritually uh, decorate it, and bring it out for special celebrations. They also mummify their respected elders. And I had a chance to be able to stay in the village and uh, photograph this particular mummified elder. In the Asmat area, when someone passes away, this woman's husband has passed away. This is a ritualized hat. No one is allowed to see her eyes. The two brothers are shaved. But what's most interesting is this raton necklace. So when the person passes away, this is the symbolic connection to their spirit. It is only after that necklace rots away is the spirit free to go into the afterworld. As I mentioned, I spent 10 years there. On one of the last trips there, uh, the guy that I had worked with died of cerebral malaria, which is quite common in this particular part of New Guinea. Took his body back to the village, and they built a spirit canoe, a symbolic canoe with the totems of his family, his clan, his children, and that was pushed off into the sunset in the afterworld at night. These are the famous Malagan masks of New Ireland and New Britain. And one of the great privileges of exploration in the 20th and 21st century is the possibility of going over the final ridge and discovering tribes that have never had contact with white people. And there still are places on the planet like that. New Guinea is one of them. Up in the bird's head, the northwest part of New Guinea, uh, is a place that's very isolated. We had figured out there were probably some tribes in a valley back there that hadn't had contact. So on the very last trip into Irianjaya, New Guinea, we put together an expedition, hiked in three weeks, and indeed we found a tribe that had never had contact with the outside world. Through a series of translators, we had the opportunity to just sit down, break bread, if you will, sit around the fire and tell the stories of what it means to be human. Ten days passed. It was time to go. I had my bags packed. We're sitting there. It was a beautiful tropical day. A thunderstorm came up the hill. Uh, they put on their very fashionable uh, raton, or rather banana leaf uh, raincoats. The storm passed. The sun was setting. And suddenly, I looked up in the sky, and some 30,000 feet above me was a jet trail, a plane, probably going from Sydney or Darwin to Kuala Lumpur or Bangkok. And then I looked around at the Stone Age tribe that were kind of looking into my eyes, wondering if this was from my world. And it struck me, what in a remarkable time to be alive, where we still have cultures that have one foot in the Garden of Eden. 
cultures, that yet we have this cross, crossroads of technology and remarkable experience. And it really struck me what a privilege for all of us to be alive, where there still are places to explore. Briefly, I want to jump into one last remarkable place, Mongolia. I have two dear friends in the audience that are from Mongolia and came tonight, and they are from a country that is extremely isolated. It's about the size of Western United States or Western Europe. The population is only three million people. Half of those live in the capital, and the rest of this vast country is wild. There are no roads in Mongolia. You just simply take off in a land cruiser and, and head out. And so it is, it's covered with these amazing deer stones that are about five to 6,000 years old. So I've had the great privilege of going back there a number of times. Terry and I literally just came back from Mongolia last week. And one of the main focuses of my uh, exploration is the privilege of being with the Golden Eagles. And the Golden Eagles are out in the western part, the Cossack part of Mongolia. Uh, Olivia, my partner in here, here uh, and I run the Cultural Sanctuaries Foundation. We build cultural centers for traditional communities around the world. We're working very closely with the eagle hunters to create a cultural center for them. What is remarkable about Mongolia, it symbolizes this massive revitalization that is going on around the world with traditional cultures. And the epicenter, I believe, is Mongolia. And so each year we go back approximately the end of September, there's a massive eagle festival where all the eagle hunters come together. What's so exciting is that the young women are now getting involved in it, and as I mentioned, there's a massive revitalization and celebration of the culture. When I first went to Mongolia, we were on an expedition. We were about five uh, days back in and we were staying with this group of eagle hunters. And they had a, a series of gears or yurts up on top of the hill. And so we had uh, scouted this place for a photograph. And this is one of the sons of Dalakan, who is one of the head eagle hunters. And what I like to do when I photograph is the first thing I do is I take an iPad. And I photograph them and show them the photograph. So there I am. And I'm uh, taking the photograph, showing him, and he said, oh, I like that photograph very much. Can I get a copy? So I took out my pen and paper, and thinking I was going to write down his address, he took out his iPhone and said, no, I've got AirDrop. I'll post it on Facebook this afternoon. And why not? This is the 21st century. Just because the eagle hunters of Mongolia have cell phones and solar panels does not mean they're any less eagle hunters. And that's my very point, is that this day and age is a combination of all the technology and the tradition as well. So I'd like to just have a, uh, one last experience I wanted to share with you. I did a book on masks, traditional masks. Near the end of the project, I had heard about this Native American. Clinkett Indian from the Northwest, and his name was Gene the Raven Dancer, and I had seen his photographs, and we made an arrangement to photograph. Late in the afternoon, he was late, the clouds were coming in, and I was getting nervous. He finally showed up with this beautiful costume. We took the photographs, we were connecting. As we walked back to his pickup truck, he said, you know, the problem with my culture, indigenous cultures, is that we are trying to decolonize ourselves. He said, we've got it wrong. We need to re-indigenize ourselves. All humans on the planet need to re-indigenize, rewild ourselves. It is the time that we need to start connecting back to those things. Margaret Mead, the great social anthropologist, once said her greatest fear, having been born into a polychromatic world, is that her children, our children, will wake up one day in a monochromatic world and never know the difference. I believe we are at the crucial crossroads that Margaret Mead mentions. Yet I am full of hope and wonder, for there are still unknown lands to be tread gently upon, discoveries still be to be made. 
That is what brought me to collaborate with Terry on this book, The Future of Exploration. I wanted to celebrate all aspects of exploration. I feel passionately about the importance and hand on heart feel the greatest air of exploration is upon us. There are still places where the map says no data available. There are still places yet undiscovered, unspoiled by the human touch. There are still places that fire up the human imagination. And as we have said in this book, this is the great age of discovery that is profoundly different. It will be driven by technology, diversity, and urgency. And perhaps, above all, by hope. As Sir Richard Branson says in the foreword to the book, we cannot protect what we don't know, and we don't know that much about our world, about most of what lies deep in the ocean, deep in space, and beyond into distant galaxies. I believe the best is yet to come. Thank you. So changing gears here, I would like to invite someone on stage who is no stranger to exploration, our good friend Sven Lindblad. Sven, of course, is one of the authors of the book, and I'm sure many of you know he is the founder and CEO of Lindblad Expeditions. He has been on the cutting edge of exploration of our planet for his entire life. Sven, please stand up and we'll uh, mosey on up here. Thank you. And Sven, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I guess I really wanted to ask you, you did such a remarkable essay. What, what are your thoughts on the future of exploration? That's a big question. <laughs> uh, you know, once upon a time, I think there was a, a lot of exploration was simply or primarily to discover for the first time something, whatever it was, climbing a mountain for the first time, diving to the deepest place for the first time, any number of uh, firsts. And, and I think that's changed quite dramatically now where exploration more broadly is, is to try and further understanding and with that understanding equip us better to, as you said, deal with the challenges that the world faces, right? You know, when I first came into contact with National Geographic, it was like decades ago, and, and National Geographic for me was like the Google <laughs> of the time, right? You know, we would, we would look through National Geographic, that's where we learned about what they referred to themselves as the world and all that's in it, disseminating knowledge and, and, and experience. And, and I always felt that, that, that it was an essential institution. And this whole idea of, of of perpetuating explorations, and I, I so remember, you know, uh, in the early days of spending time with Terry and really admiring the work that he did, perpetuating the opportunity for young people to explore the world. That 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 we need to have as many explorers as we possibly can that can bring in information, ideas, thoughts back, and help us kind of navigate the complexity of what we've got to deal with. So. You said, you know, the best is yet to come in terms of exploration. I, I, I think in many ways the relevance of exploration has simply increased in importance. In the absence of exploration, we have no hope of, uh, of dealing with these challenges, and we, we have to deal with them, whether it's climate change, loss of species, cultural loss, language loss. I mean, all of this is happening, and we have to do our very best to try and figure out how to... Uh, how to keep it from happening. And uh, explorers are gonna play a big, big role. And, and uh, I loved in your essay, you, you talked about the trinity. There's three important elements for you in the business of sustainable tourism and sharing the world with people. You might wanna talk about those sort of conservation, um, engagement in the culture, uh, business model. Well, I mean, in terms of a business model, I, 
Well, first of all, I mean, unabashedly, I'm in the business of taking people exploring, right? Laymen exploring. And, I, and, and you know, they were referring to there are few people, there are a uh, small number of people who have this extreme explorer gene where they'll do the most crazy things. But then there's another level of explorers, like most of the folks in this room who have it in one form or another and want to go out, learn, understand. And so, in essence, you're all explorers. I mean, that's the reality of it. Uh, and my, my, my lens as a business really is I look through everything through a triangle and the triangle basically has the traveler, the place, and the enterprise and if benefits flow in all directions then it's a model that makes sense and if one of those points of the triangle are not, ser uh, are not serviced or, 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 or considered it's a broken idea. So for me that makes life very, very clear. I mean, that, that's the North Star with uh, which I navigate what I try and do professionally. Um, but I didn't, come to the, I didn't come to the business world as a consequence of being trained in business. I know nothing about business. I mean, I didn't. I kind of learned it. Uh, but it was really, I, you know, I lived in East Africa when I was, I lived in Kenya in my 20s. And I had a seismic experience, and I think all of you probably, if you reach into your, uh, think about this, what, when was a moment in life where something happened that changed the trajectory of where you were going, right? And, and in my case, it was one day I was a little bored. I was working at a camp in Savo East National Park, the largest national park in Kenya, which also had the largest population of both elephant and black rhino, which were very much under their assault at the time. Uh, or beginning to really be under assault. And, and I went out and I decided I wanted to find out how many rhino I could find in a day. And I found 59 individual black rhino. That's a lot. And I was very proud of myself and I was very pleased with it. I, I mean, 10, 15 in a day were, was fairly normal. 59 was pretty extraordinary. Um, 10 years later, I went back and spent a week there with a friend and I couldn't find one. And all of those rhinos wound up in Yemen as dagger handles or in China as, you know, some form of supposed medicine. And, and, and it dawned on me that this is way, way too much power that human beings have to be able to, in a decade, wipe out a population like that. And how are we capable of doing that? And, and it really spurred my desire to, to use whatever resources I could in business to, to, to make a connection between the world, the wonder of the world, and the challenges of the world. And I felt that travelers could play an important role uh, because they become ambassadors, soldiers, if you will, uh, who have a greater degree of knowledge and caring, and that, to me, meant, meant a lot. So um, time is short. So would love to open it up to the audience. Are there questions? We have an extra mic here. Um, there's a question. Is there someone that can? So there's a gentleman in the back there. Thank you. Thank you. This question's for Terry. This is going back about 30 minutes, but in the Palazzo Vecchio, when you put that camera through that hole, was there a lost Da Vinci? <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of those bits of unfinished business. We put the camera back there. We detected traces of uh, paint that was then analyzed, and the constituent elements were consistent with the recipe that da Vinci had used to paint this, this painting. This, this painting, by the way, was reputed to be his masterpiece. Uh, people who saw it at the time described it as miraculous. Uh, it's called the Battle of Anghiari. Uh, the, the, there's one copy that is in the Louvre. Uh, it, it's a magnificent painting, and it it was on the wall of the Palazzo Vecchia for about 90 years. And then the Medici's hired um, a an architect by the name of Vasari, also a painter, to paint over it. And Vasari had had this habit uh, of not destroying these masterpieces. He'd been commissioned in, in the past to do that, and he put up what we believe was a false wall so that he could protect the, the da Vinci, and then he painted clues. 
And if you go to the Palazzo Vecchia today, and if you look up in the Hall of 500, uh, way up in the, the right-hand corner of, of his fresco, uh, there is a flag. It's a banner held by one of the soldiers. And it, it says uh, Treco Trova or something like that. But basically it means in old Italian, he who seeks shall find. And it's positioned over the uh, Da Vinci. And so it's there. Uh, we had some problems convincing the Uffizi and some of the other art people that ripping off of Vasari was a good idea to find a <laughs> Da Vinci. But I'm confident that at some point we're going to do that. Any other questions? One here. How questions? much pushback do you get from governments? We haven't heard about um, what it takes to actually get permission to do some of these things and to go into some of these places that may be protected, may be under military authority. Do you get pushback? Yes. Um, <laughs> it depends. Sometimes a lot. Uh, that... Uh, image I showed of uh, Kabul, of this subterranean vault, where we thought that the uh, Bactrian gold was, was kept, 22,000 pieces of, of solid gold jewelry. Um, the Afghans were very reluctant to let us come in there, uh, even though we, we said, look, all we want to do is work with the curators to see if we can find it. Uh, they uh, had serious reservations, and it took, uh, well, we, we were there for several weeks trying to convince them that uh, we were on the up and up and that all we wanted to do was to help conserve it. Uh, so it, it varies from government to government, but yes, that is always a concern, and sometimes um, you have to call off the expedition. I know there's a gentleman up here that has a question. Thank you. Um, I've been reading a book lately um, called The Scramble for Africa by uh, Thomas Peckinham. And I was wondering what you, which you would consider the modern day explorers, think of uh, the earlier explorers like Livingston and Stanley that basically opened up Africa for exploitation by European coloni colonizing powers. Well, that question is, is obviously a um, loaded one in the 21st century, but let, let's, let's go back into the, the time of that period, certainly with the British Empire. You know, it is hardwired into humans to discover, to go beyond the horizon. So the source of the Nile, to go to the South Pole, to go to the North Pole, to go to Everest, and and now to go to the, the bottom of the Mariana Trench is hardwired hard in, in us. So I think some of the decisions that were made then, of course, take the lens of today as inappropriate, but we always want to explore. And I know Terry wants to answer this one too. <laughs> well, so I, I would urge you to read the book um, because there are several essays that tackle that question. Uh, and I mentioned Paula Kahumba, uh, who made the point about uh, exploration from the African perspective is very different. And in fact, Africans went to Europe, but you don't hear about their discoveries, their exploration. Um, it, you know, the narrative that we have was written by Westerners uh, and you know, she makes the point that the Africans knew all of these things that the Europeans claimed that they were discovering. Uh, and they knew it very well and they understood it. Uh, but the Europeans considered it new and exotic. Uh, I mean, Chris has made the point about this was a different time. Uh, obviously, the, there was exploitation. Uh, but read Paula's essay and some of the other uh, new explorers and, and one other thing, the, the, the point that they make is that we've, we have a tendency, and one of the reasons that at National Geographic I wanted to expand the base of, of, of explorers and, and make it more diverse, uh, we have a tendency to look at things through a particular lens. 
Uh, and we have a new generation now that is, is taking over leadership in many of these different disciplines. And they see the world very differently from the way uh, the traditional scientists have, which tend to be Western, North American, European. Uh, they're looking at it at a much different lens. And you can look at, at something very familiar uh, and if you have a different lens, you're going to come away with a different impression, with different uh, uh, conclusions about it. And so th that's one of the reasons we wanted to do this book, to present these different perspectives. One right here? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Go um, ahead. We'll get to you. When... Um, uh, yep, we can hear you. Go ahead. When you talk about the ought and the can and the can and the ought, uh, a great example with Gabon and that um, exploration rendered the preservation and protection of lands. With eight billion people on Earth, all, many eager to explore, do you ever find places or things that you say, we should keep this one secret? So that, so that the eight billion don't ruin it for everyone. <laughs> like, does it does does all of this require more care now with eight billion than it did in eighteen hundred? Oh, only, absolutely, yeah, yeah. and absolutely. And there are places that I've gone that I will never publish or talk about, and there are places that I know of that I will never go because I simply should not go. And I think um, certainly in Sven's business and in the business of travel, I think we have to take on that responsibility. I don't know if you want to address yeah, that. It's a, it's a really complicated yeah. question. From the perspective of, so another way of looking at the world is, is, is through a scale. And there's positive and there's negative. And there's very few things that are completely one way or the other. Well, there are a lot of things that are completely negative, but, <laughs> but there, there, are not a many, there are not a lot of things that are 100% positive. And, you know, when I think about it, you know, a place like the Serengeti, for example, I know for a fact that if visitors did not go to the Serengeti, it would be a cornfield. That's just the way it is, because whether that's right or wrong is, is a whole different question, but the reality of it is is that, the, that, that wild places, for example, often have to pay their way in order to be able to be protected. And one of the ways to do it, obviously, is, is through visitation. And sometimes that manifests itself in rather unattractive ways, and we've got to constantly kind of grapple with it and try and figure out how to balance it. But, uh, but there, are, there are a few perfect solutions. But I, I, I do believe that we have, to, we have to find creative ways to show appreciation for places in order for them to be protected, put it that way. Sir, I think you had a question. Mike, uh, one more question. There you go. Thank you. I was curious uh, along the lines of uh, <clears throat> when you went to visit the people in the valleys, do you, uh, first of all, in the unlikely event that anyone has ever come from the valleys to visit us over here, we'd be interested to hear that story. Um, and they have, actually. Ah, interesting. So also I was wondering if you are able to keep in touch with them uh, and by any means. And what, what is their curiosity about us? Well, I just talked to them on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> there was a group of agats, you know, the uh, totem poles, the photograph that is. So the Rockefeller um, Museum commissioned a group uh, from that particular tribal area to come over and build a series of those beautiful poles that you can see in the Metropolitan. So. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no one answer to that, but um, certainly the eagle eagle hunters, uh, Jasla over here, my friend from Mongolia, is one of the people uh, very responsible for um, uh, revitalizing the eagle tradition. So good job, Jasla. Um, <laughs> And we keep in touch with them. I, uh, under uh, Terry's uh, jurisdiction at the National Geographic, I headed up a program called All Roads, where we supported indigenous and underrepresented filmmakers, photographers, storytellers. And we brought them to Washington. And they were trained in technology 
They knew how to tell the story. So there's all sorts of variations of, of paying respect to their culture. Okay, one final note. Yep. For those of you who are online watching this, if you want the book, you can go on Amazon or more, more, more preferably, even better, to your local bookstore. Yes. So thank you very much. Terry, myself, and Sven will be out, and we are selling books. So thank you very much for a great evening. <laughs>